Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our subject matter is multiple sclerosis. And this is dedicated to my friend, Sherry Ogletree. Um, she has a little bit more advanced multiple sclerosis, but based upon some of the research I'm coming up with, there's a lot of good preventative things out there and a lot of things that we can do once you've had it to keep it from reoccurring again. You know, the research I found, there was so much research, but it looks like a lot of these researchers just never get together and put all their information together uh, in an investigative manner. And so hopefully the information I give you today will do a little bit of that. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me at the store and we'll help you out. What is multiple sclerosis? And technically it's a chronic progressive degenerative disease of the central nervous system, which the myelin sheaths, which are little protections around the, the uh, nerve cells in the brain, spinal cord, and um, optic nerve, they start to unravel. And they get little breaks in between them to where the axon, where the actual nerve is exposed. Now, UC Santa Barbara, and I take my hats off to them because they're the only ones really seriously that got to the bottom of why there's damage caused by MS. These nerves get exposed. They become unraveled. And what happens is they have a negative charge to them. They have fatty acid lipids on these membranes. And then there's a myelin protein that binds. It's a positive charge. And you know, negative and positive, they get attracted to each other. Well, what happens is, is when the little um, myelin sheath is unraveled and has been damaged, it, this positive charge kind of acts like glue. And it sits in there, and it causes scar tissue and fibrin buildup and literally renders the nerve not usable any longer. So the key is, is to prevent these fibers from unraveling or to repair the unraveling of these fibers. Um, it, what's interesting about multiple sclerosis is a person can get all the symptoms and then never have it again. It can go into remission for 10 years, two months, never. So very difficult for doctors uh, to diagnose as well. So the key is, is Prevention, if you get it, to stop it from progressing. And if you've got it progressed, to stop it from further progressing and maybe do a little bit of repairing. So very common in countries that have northern latitudes. Um, very common in countries that have a high saturated diet in combination with carbohydrates. It's kind of funny. There are countries that eat really high saturated diets and have very low saturated fat diets and have very low incidence of multiple sclerosis. But when you add those carbohydrates along with those saturated fats, it seems to be extremely inflammatory to the nervous system for a lot of other things as well, too, um, diseases and disorders that we have in this country. But also, too, knowing that it's um, northern latitudes, the northern Europe, uh, United States, Canada, we also know that those areas get a lot less vitamin D. Now, getting less vitamin D because the way the latitude, uh, the angles of the sun are. So we're going to talk about further about how much vitamin D you need to supplement with. But I've got to say, that is probably one of the most important things to recognize is if you live in the northern latitudes, which we do here in Lompoc, you got to keep the vitamin D levels up. Um, symptoms. Now, oftentimes it'll start with you know, a little blurry vision, a little dizziness, your, your speech gets a little bit kind of impaired, and you just cut a little bit of numbness. And those are kind of the initial symptoms that you'll get with it, and then it may go away, and you may never know that you ever had um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis. More advanced wise, you get tremors, vomiting, inability to control the bowels, uh, infections in the bladder or incontinence issues occur, and then oftentimes then you can become wheelchair ridden when the nerves have sustained a lot of scarring or damage to them. So let's go over here and we're going to discuss some of the causes. Now we truly don't know a lot of the causes, but I got to tell you based upon the research that I came across, I think most of the uh, issues have to do with diet and nutrition. Um, that vitamin D deficiency, B12 deficiencies. A lot of people have a lot of digestion issues, and when, you're B when you have digestion issues or something called leaky gut, you do not um, utilize vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 is very important for the nervous system and myelin uh, repair and response and reaction. 
So poor nutrition and the lack of good fats in the diet and the increase in carbohydrate intake and saturated fatty acids, in my opinion, leave you wide open to multiple sclerosis, a lot of other things, but multiple sclerosis. I think, in my personal opinion, based upon the research, if that diet is in order, you got D and B12, you're eating your nuts, you're good, clean fish, I don't think you're going to get MS. Um, there are some genetic tendencies towards it, but we know that when the immune system is healthy, um, it's more difficult. Um, there's some autoimmune response that we believe is triggered in MS, maybe possibly caused by a viral or bacterial infections. We know people with Epstein-Barr or uh, chronic fatigue syndrome have a much greater chance of getting multiple sclerosis later on. So we don't know if maybe these viral or bacterial um, left untouched and left alone when the immune system all of a sudden starts attacking itself could be attacking these myelon sheaths and eating away the, and unraveling as well when the nutrients just aren't there to feed these nerves. Environmental toxins and toxic metals, they prevent the, the proper firing of the nerves sometimes as well too. And so determining whether or not, and there are a blood tests that you can have conducted that can test for this toxic metal exposure. Environmental toxins, uh, here in the United States, it's pretty difficult to avoid them because they're in all our foods and everything else, water, fabrics, everything. So when you can eat organic, please eat organic, chemical-free, what you're putting in your mouth, and then know where you're getting your foods from. Uh, fast food restaurants, I was watching something on Netflix, and I got to tell you, what they're adding chemically to the food and the way they're raising the food and processing this food and then handing it out and calling it food, it isn't food. It has no nutritional value, basically, other than full of chemicals and garbage. Um, food allergies. Now, we find a great portion of people that have multiple sclerosis are also milk, egg, and gluten intolerant. So it is really, really important if you are gluten intolerant to avoid wheat and gluten-producing foods. If you have MS, I would definitely get tested for gluten intolerance. I think it's paramount that you do so. Because when you're gluten intolerant you will be in, and you eat gluten, you will be inflamed all of the time. No exception. And if you're inflamed all the time, you open yourself up to autoimmune issues and damage to your nervous system. Um, some indication that some immunizations might trigger this, and we don't know per se if it has to do with the mercury and the adjuncts that they put into the immunizations that trigger these neurological issues. Um, we saw recently a cheerleader that was vaccinated with the flu vaccine all of a sudden, you saw it on, she was walking, could not walk forward anymore. She sustained muscular and neurological damage caused from this vaccine or the adjuncts that were put in the vaccine. So being aware, immunizations could be a contributing factor to these nervous system types of disorders. Um, hormonal imbalances. Um, we're talking about thyroid, progesterone, estrogens, and we'll talk about later on some of the supplements that are utilized hormonally that seem to affect um, uh, MS or relieve some of the symptoms of it. But basically, when we have all these chemical estrogens going into our body from pesticides, herbicides, we get inflamed. We get out of balance. Our immune systems won't work properly. Our thyroid, everything gets out of balance. So getting rid of these chemical estrogen mimickers, by, you know, all of them, the plastics, all of them, you need to remove as much as you possibly can um, out of your diet. And I'm not being an alarmist. I'm just looking at the science and some of the reports I know that Ralph talks about and that I give you. It isn't good. You need to dispose of as much chemicals as you possibly can and eat as clean as you possibly can and use clinging agents when you clean your homes and your, and your laundry that are as chemical free as possible. In the diet, obviously you're going to avoid all foods that are uh, allergy producing or if you are gluten intolerant, milk intolerant, egg intolerant, you don't include them in your diet. Um, avoiding, if you have MS, you need to avoid eating red meat, fried food, saturated foods, saturated fat foods, and you need to eat tons and tons of raw fruits and vegetables and good, clean, extremely lean meats, 
if you eat any meat at all, fish and chicken maybe. But mostly a vegetarian diet when you have MS seems to do the trick. Now I'm not talking about the vegetarian diet where you're grabbing the pastas and the sugars all day long. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about good, wholesome fruits and vegetables, not refined junk food. That's the worst thing you can give your body under any circumstances, particularly if you have multiple sclerosis. I am of the belief that if you listen to what I have to say here, that if you have had beginning stages of MS, you can stop it from occurring further, or you can do some prevention. Based upon all the research I have gathered, I truly do believe that. So please listen closely. Um, avoid all alcohol, caffeine, or acid-producing foods. Um, eating nuts, clean fish, fiber. This country, because we don't eat fruits and vegetables, our fiber content is very low. 30 to 35 grams of fiber we're supposed to get in a day to maintain good bowel function. I can tell you, most people out there on the good old fast food diet, they're lucky if they're getting 10 grams of fiber. And they come into me and they talk about all their issues with their stomach, and they can't have bowel movements, they've got blood pressure issues, and they wonder why. Well, we've got to keep fiber high. We've got to keep the toxins moving out of the body so that they don't get reabsorbed. Supplement-wise, oh my gosh, there are so, is so much research out there, and everything I'm listed on here, you can go online and you can confirm the research. And so I've tried to pre uh, present as much of it as I possibly can so that you can look it up yourself. Fish oils, 50 to 20 grams, and I'm not talking about just taking a couple of fish oil pills a day. I'm talking about buying the liquids and you're going to take the fish oils. There's some real good tasting ones out there. They reduce inflammation and they provide the fatty acid material for myelin sheath repair. Repair. They increase prostaglandin 1 production, and if you do away with some of these meat fats and saturated fats, oh man, the inflammatory will go down so substantially. Borage oil, evening primrose oil, in combination with the fish oil, reduces inflammation. B12. Um, B12, once again, we talked about how that may be a contributing factor in, for people getting MS. Um, when you have it, um, this should, uh, four to 800 micrograms of sublingual, there's a methyl source of sublingual B12, melts under the tongue, helps with nerve repair and reduces. It's key in myelin sheath formation. If you're B12 deficient, you're going to have nerve issues and nerve problems and your MS is going to trigger it and continually hurt you. A good multiple vitamin, high in B vitamins, and if you'd like to take an extra B on top of that, that would be a doggone good thing because since our foods are so nut nutritionally deficient, oh man, you need to be getting those additional, and I don't care what the doc says on this because they're wrong. Our foods are not, I was in agriculture, our foods and our soil are not what they used to be. You cannot get your, st your nutrients from food anymore. You can't, not unless you're getting totally sustained organic produce. And I don't know any place here in, in Lompoc or anywhere within 100 miles of here that grow sustained organic produce in a full range. Doesn't exist. Alpha lipoic acid fights neuropathy. We use it a lot on diabetic neuropathy and it's a very strong antioxidant. Uh, my son, uh, Derek, at my uh, Grover Beach store, there was a, a, a former police officer that came in and he could barely walk. He was using just unbelievable amount of pain. And he was complaining his nerves were tingling and everything. And on a hunch, together they worked out and he started taking alpha lipoic acid. Three weeks later, the man walks in upright with one cane. And I know that sounds like kind of like one of these religious types of, of healings, but it wasn't. The man seriously, absolutely can now walk and function. And he just did one thing. In addition, Begay went through the diet with him. He modified his diet. There we go. And he was pretty advanced stages of multiple sclerosis. Enzymes, they help uh, digest the food and lessen autoimmune responses, particularly if you have leaky gut. NADH, uh, Boston Children's Hospital did a wonderful study in 2006. And basically what they found was NAD protected against long-term disability for MS patients. It protects the nerve axons 
from degeneration before and after myelin loss. So MS patients tend to have low levels of the NAD. So guess what? There's a supplement out there in, a, in health food stores that you can take that can help with myelin repair. Vitamin D, D 400, a study done in the Journal of Neurology, 400 or more decreased MS by 40%, the reoccurrence and uh, ever coming down with it. Bromelain eats fibrin, the scar tissue. Bromelain and natokinase eats fibrin around the, uh, the nerves. We can eat it up. We can repair it. I'm of the firm belief, no matter what they say, that MS can be reversed if given the proper nutrition. Ginkgo biloba, University of San Diego study, show, uh, showed 240 milligrams a day, showed cognitive and memory decline ceased. Increase in attention. Increase the ability, because a lot of MS patients have memory issues, and so it increased the ability for them and their, in their brains to function at a more normal level. Estriols and testosterones. Natural hormones, um, estriol is a natural hormone that the body increases at time of pregnancy. So a lot of pregnant women have decreased symptoms in, in, in MS. So it's a natural estrogen. And then testosterone, you can read right here, absolutely stopped or slowed brain atrophy in men, particularly. The study was done on men. Those, and never showed any increase in prostate issues against all of what they try to tell us about prostate cancer. Good bacteria, keeping the good, um, uh, good vitamin C's. And see the levels I have on here, 400 to 10,000 milligrams? It lowers edema and allergic response. Edema is swelling and inflammation. Phosphatidylserine and choline help around the myelin. They also help with short-term memory. It's a key fatty acid. CoQ10 and glycine have additional research as well. I wish I had more time to get into this a little bit further, but here's it in a nutshell. Take it and do with it what you will and what you can. We're going to be moving next on to our fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today, hmm, as you know, every week I get, I focus on, on certain things that customers talk to me about. And a lot of my ladies are coming in with a lot of pain being caused by their real high boots and their real high heels. And they're having a lot of foot and ankle pain. And I wanted to show some uh, stretching exercises that I think could help alleviate that. Now, when you have your uh, high heels on, and you wear them a lot, you're going to shorten in this particular area the muscle tissues and so and the tendons and ligaments. So when you take the shoe off, it's just going to seize on you. So uh, a little, some suggestions here on some stretching exercises that you might want to do in between um, during the day when you get a chance to take your shoes off and then after you take them off at night. And simply just grabbing your foot here, you pull up on here, and then going up and down getting some circulation into the uh, tendons and ligaments here that shorten up when we're wearing high heels, and then pointing and releasing, and then doing that. And if you can just take a little bit of care to do that, like maybe just a couple minutes a day, if you're going to wear those high heels, ah, you don't want to shorten that or you're going to end up with a lot of pain. So wearing the high heels is beautiful and sexy, but do a little bit of massage and taking care of your feet and your ankles. Next, we'll be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the church portion of our show, and with us today, thankfully, is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. Now, where we left off last time was on GERD. What I brought up last time was the UT Southwestern Medical Center came out with some interesting research on what's actually probably the main cause of GERD. Now, normally, this gastro or reflux esophagitis is thought to be caused by stomach acids. At least that's what people have been taught in medical school. Now, what they did was an interesting experiment. They actually took stomach acid and applied it directly to basically the esophageal lining, expecting to see some sort of chemical burn. 
Just much like you take battery acid and you pour it on your skin, the damage is immediate. It didn't happen. In fact, it did not happen for weeks. What they discovered is that GERD was not caused by stomach acids at all, but I'll say exactly what they said. They said rather the gastroesophageal reflux spurs the esophageal cells to release chemicals called cytokines, which attract inflammatory cells to the esophagus, meaning obviously inflammation. It is those inflammatory cells drawn to the esophagus by cytokines that cause the esophageal damage that is characteristic of GERD. The condition is manifested by symptoms such as heartburn and chest pain. Quote unquote, Dr. Seward Speckler said, that doesn't make sense if GERD is really the result of acid burn as we were all taught in medical school. So something to really think, and also make you double think too, a lot of those commercials on TV claim it to be the healing pill because it neutralizes your stomach acids. Well, think about it. If esophageal erosion is being caused by inflammation and not stomach acids, then how did they come up with their studies that these pills actually help you heal? Yeah, you take acid away from basically an open wound, it helps solve the burn, but does not cause, stop the reason why it's happening to begin with. All right, moving on. It's Christmas time and people are buying toys. Well, here's a little reminder. They came from basically the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. In 2007, most of your toys that were recalled, in fact, almost all of the toys recalled in 2007 were manufactured in China. Why? Well, the majority of those reasons outside of small parts and things like that, which obviously can be design flaws, they still continue to use lead paint. So when thinking about the safety of your children and making sure it's a good Christmas for many years to come, think about where those toys are manufactured. If the country has not learned its lesson after all of these decades about what this does, are they gonna start learning it by tomorrow or the next time or the next time? I don't think so. Following up to our next article, Young Adults' Blood Levels Linked to Depression and Panic Disorder. This came from the Archives of Journal Psychiatry and the JAMA Archive Journal. This just came out December 7th. What they discovered was this. The children that had the highest lead levels in their system, and they did this study between 1999 and 2004. In fact, let me not even paraphrase. Let me read it directly to you. It said the average blood level was 1.61 micrograms per deciliter. So the average kid out there had 1.61 micrograms of blood per deciliter in their system. The one-fifth of participants with the highest blood levels, I'm not talking a lot, we're just talking 2.11 micrograms per deciliter or more, had 2.3 times the odds of having a major depressive disorder and nearly five times the odds of having panic disorders as composed of those with the lowest lead levels. Interesting to correlate ADD and mental disorders in children. Often we look at a lot of things like vaccinations and things like that, but would it be bizarre if there was actually a causative relationship with our increased number of imports from China, i.e. lead painted toys, and the number of mental disorders happening in our children in the United States? Interesting thing to think about, and if you can, Go for toys. Don't have to buy it here domestically, even though made in USA is better. But look at where you get those toys. All right. After that, now we go to the antidepressants. May increase risk of stroke and death. There was a study that came out that examined 136,000 postmenopausal females. The title of the article said they had a small but significant increase for stroke and death compared to those who do not take the drugs. Well, let's look, a lot, let's look at what that small meant. All right, the study examined 136,000 women between the ages of 50 to 79 for six years. All were off of antidepressants when they started. The researchers did not find any difference in coronary heart disease. However, they did observe a significant difference in stroke rates. Antidepressant users were 45% more likely to experience strokes than women who were not taking antidepressants. The study also found that when the overall death rates, cause of all mortality, were added in, the women taking the antidepressants had a 32% chance of dying from all other causes. Now, you can take that as being a small statistical difference if you like. 
I don't think it's very small. And now, congratulations to Hawaii. Hawaii H1N1 resolution advances vaccine exemptions favoring Americans' growing demand for health freedoms. What happens? Department of Health officials tried to make vaccinations mandatory, but the County of Hawaii directors overruled it, favoring First Amendment constitutional rights and vaccination exemptions for everyone demanding them. It was a seven to one vote, nearly unanimous in the big island of Hawaii. I'm gonna run through a little, this a little fast, just because of time. The concern was that people did not trust the vaccines and there was no actual good evidence to support it. Said so the vote demonstrated the power of the local community to rebuke top-down policies of advancing mandatory vaccinations. The resolution 237 to nine urges state and federal legislators in Hawaii to amend vaccine laws to include medical, religious, and philosophical, ex philosophical exemptions for any vaccine program, including those declared urgent by health officials. And here's the kicker. I didn't really read much into this, so I kept on reading and looked at the conflict of interest that led on. It says, we are compelled by science and history to not repeat deadly mistakes, said Reverend R.J. Hampton, legislative aide to Neil Noel Beacon. So our, study, our office studied vaccine science and edited the resolution to read, quote, that any vaccine known to contain harmful viruses or any material known to prompt autoimmune diseases or cancer risks shall provide cause for exemption for any person in the state of Hawaii who so desires such an exemption. This is a big win for the people. And who made this quote? Dr. Leonard Horowitz. Who's Leonard Horowitz? Obviously must not know anything about vaccines because he's anti-vaccine. No, he's a Harvard trained authority in vaccinations and emerging diseases who advised the research committee that considered opinions of several leading US constitutional attorneys. This was the straw that broke the camel back. As they began to argue with the health director of Hawaii, they began to find a little conflict of interest going on. They discovered the bulletin that feed and publishes the Associated Press information news advancing vaccination agendas on behalf of the AP Associated Press Director Rupert Murdoch was communicating directly with the health service director in Hawaii and his politically powerful partners from the New York City PFNYC, the world's wealthiest biotechnology investment group. Besides that, Rupert Murdoch's son, James, directs GlaxoSmithKline, the one that markets the vaccines, and Tamiflu, that was purchased by the health department. Plus, Rupert Murdoch's co-chairman of his investment fund, Lloyd Balkin, owns a majority of Metamune, which produces the H1 flu mist vaccine that Dr. Funu that Dr. Funaku stockpiled. Congratulations, Y, for actually looking a little deeper into it than what actually was on the surface. And hopefully other communities begin to follow suit. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, research, look things up online for yourself, pay attention to your health. Thank you very much for joining our show.